Welcome to M&A Mondays, the UK's first YouTube series dedicated to all things M&A. From interviews with the leading figures in the industry, to coffee chats with analysts, diversity panels, all the way through to workshops, we'll be covering it all. We do hope you enjoy the video and please give us a like and a follow on our social media. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode in M&A Mondays, the UK's first YouTube series dedicated to all things M&A. My name is Patrick Broughton and I'm the founder and co-head of the UCL M&A Group and alongside me is Nicola, an events officer and an energy and power analyst within the group. Uh, today we are absolutely delighted and honoured to be joined by Sean Brown. Uh, Sean started his career at PwC where he became a chartered accountant. After this, he went on to join HSBC, where he held numerous positions, including the CEO of HSBC Investment Bank in India, as well as co-founding the firm's consumer M&A team. Uh, he left HSBC in 2002 to co-found McQueen, a London-based investment bank, which grew to become one of the most successful M&A advisors uh, to the European consumer sector, uh, before being acquired by Hulihan Loki in 2015. Uh, currently, Sean is a managing director and the co-head of the UK corporate finance at Hulikan Loki. In addition, he's also the head of Hulikan Loki's consumer food and retail group in Europe. Uh, we are incredibly honoured to have Sean here with us today. So without further ado, let's begin. Hi, Sean. How are you? Patrick, Nicola, uh, I'm very well indeed. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a great privilege and an honour for me to be with you and with your your colleagues and students today thank you well thank you very much I, I guess the first question I wanted to ask you then was having start, started your career at PwC and becoming a chartered accountant there what made you switch to becoming an investment banker right well the first thing is I, I always viewed chartered accountancy as a bit like a, a three-year post-grad further degree further qualification uh, I was never especially interested in being an auditor. In fact, I think I can probably say I was probably the worst auditor that PwC ever hired, uh, and I certainly didn't enjoy it very much. Um, but it was a means to an end for me. I, I always had an interest in finance. I didn't, when I was at university, know an awful lot about the city or financial services or how it all worked. And I thought that having three or four years at a, at a top four firm like Pricewaterhouse would be very helpful to me in terms of teaching me how the world of finance and the world of accountancy worked, as well as coming up with a qualification that um, would be able to be with me for the rest of my of my career. So that's why I joined PW or PW, it was PW in those days, it wasn't even PWC. Uh, I had every intention of leaving pretty much as soon as I'd qualified, um, but the best laid plans uh, you know, go amiss and things don't always work out how you expect it. And I, I left university at 21. I qualified at Pricewaterhouse age 24. And actually, I stayed on for three or four years after qualifying. I did a stint in Pricewaterhouse's office in South Africa. I did two years in the training department at Pricewaterhouse in London. And then I moved into the corporate finance team at Pricewaterhouse in London when it was very small. It was a very fledgling department in the late 80s, early 90s. There were I mean, barely more than a handful of us doing corporate finance. And even in those days, I recall that the nickname of the department was the Departure Lounge, as it seemed to be where uh, some of the um, uh, audit practitioners who fancied a move into the city, into merchant banking, into investment banking, uh, would go pending a, a move into, uh, into the investment banking world. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, I guess the next question I wanted to ask was, um, you later went on to join HSBC, where you accomplished a great deal from becoming the CEO of HSBC Investment Bank in India to setting up the firm's consumer m and team. I guess the India experience sounds quite unique, so I just wanted to ask a bit about that. What, what was it like covering that region and how did you fall into that position? 
<laughs> well, I thoroughly enjoyed it, Patrick. It was a, a fascinating period of my life. I went out to India with two children. I came back with four. So um, I've got many reasons to be uh, to be grateful for what um, for the impact India left on me. Uh, there is a vaguely entertaining story about India, which I, I can tell you, which explains a little bit how I got into it. And it involves uh, when I left Pricewaterhouse and joined HSBC in, in 1992. Uh, I was 28 years old and I left Pricewaterhouse on the 30th of June and I started with HSBC on the 1st of July, which was my first mistake. Uh, I think it's always a, a Bit of advice I would give to anybody at that sort of age when you are changing jobs take a little bit of time off and smell the coffee between the two because uh, as you progress through your career there's not many times in your life when you can have a little bit of a time off and I look back at that and, and having not taken any time off between the two is a bit of a regret but it was particularly sad because I, I joined HSBC on the basis that my then boss said to me we're incredibly busy Sean and we really need you to get your feet under the desk and get started straight away so I joined on the 1st of July. And after I'd sort of been inducted and, and shown where my desk was and where I should go and buy a sandwich for lunch and where the loo is and where the photocopier is and where the coffee machine is and all the really important aspects of a new job, I then found there wasn't very much for me to do, partly because we were heading into the sort of summer slowdown at the end of mid, mid to end of July and people were heading off on holiday. And after about three or four weeks of literally sitting my test doing very little, I went to see my then boss. And uh, I will never forget the meeting. In those days, we all had offices. We hadn't moved to open plan. And of course, this was pre-computers. So everybody was working with huge piles of paper on their desks. And I walked into his office and I looked at him and I said, hello, Duncan. And he looked up and he glared at me, sort of as like a rabbit caught him in the headlight, didn't quite know what I was doing in his office, this little squit of an analyst who just joined. And he said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I said, well, if I'm honest, sir, um, I'm a little bit bored. Uh, are you bored? Bored? And I said, yes, I haven't got enough to do. And he sort of started rummaging around in the piles of paperwork on his desk and looking at the paper and looking at me and looking around as though he was finding inspiration from somewhere. And he eventually picked up a piece of paper and he looked at me and he stared and he said, do you know anything about India? And I was so dumbstruck by this behavior that I resorted in the way that many uh, Brits do to sarcasm, uh, which probably wasn't a good idea with the benefit of hindsight. So I started to answer his question by saying, India? Yes, Duncan, I know an awful lot about India because my father worked there for six months when he was 18. But I never got to finish the question. And the moment I'd said, yes, Duncan, I know an awful lot about India because he went, brilliant, brilliant, well, you're the man for this. And he thrust a bit of paper at me. And, and basically, for those of you who know anything about your Indian economic history, in 1992, uh, uh, India was in a somewhat precarious financial position and had to go to the World Bank uh, for, uh, for a further dose of loans. And one of the conditions that the World Bank made to the then Prime Minister Narasimha Rao and the uh, Finance Minister Manmohan Singh was to say that they had to open up the economy to foreign investment because up until 92, it was substantially closed. And the way most Indian companies reacted to that was to do secondary issues of some of their shares on international stock exchanges to enable international institutional investors to in invest in their companies. But in those days, because it was almost impossible for institutional investors to invest in India, uh, nobody knew anything about the Indian economy, the market or the companies. And a lot of these Indian companies decided they wanted to tap these international markets. And they went to their local banking relationship at HSBC in Bombay, who passed it over to the equity capital markets team in London, uh, whereupon it ended up in my rather startled lap. Um, so I, I called my colleagues out in Hong Kong Bank in India and ended up going out there. And uh, to cut a very long story short, we ended up picking up a lot of uh, equity issuance mandates from Indian companies looking to, to raise capital on the international stock exchanges. And uh, we raised a lot of capital for Indian companies. And I'm pleased to say we made quite a decent amount of commission for ourselves simultaneously. Uh, and after three years, all my competitors had woken up to the idea that this was a bit of a, uh, a, a 1990s gold rush 
and were starting sending people down to India. And the chairman of the bank said to me, come on, Sean, you've been doing a month, or sorry, a week per month in India for the last three years. Isn't it time you thought about moving down there full time? So in 1995, aged, um, aged 30, uh, I jumped on an airplane with my two very small children and my rather bemused wife. And we flew down to Delhi. Uh, we didn't have anywhere to stay. We didn't have a company down there. Um, we didn't have an office. We didn't have any employees. The Hong Kong Bank was down there, which was a, a sister company. Uh, we stayed in a hotel in Delhi for about seven or eight weeks while I, I found an office, chose what colour to paint the walls, uh, which carpet to put on the floor, started recruiting people, simultaneously had to find a house uh, for me and the family to live in. Uh, find schools for the children to go to, and uh, we took it from there. Brilliant. That sounds really, yeah, really exciting. Thanks for that, Sean. And following up from that uh, last question and the thing that you mentioned, uh, you have co-founded uh, McQueen, one of the most successful uh, advisors in the European consumer sector. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what led you to uh, found the firm, uh, some of the main optical, obstacles that you faced in the beginning and how did you manage to grow the company so successfully? Uh, I'm happy to try and answer it. So, so Nicola, yes, I, I, I spent three and a half years in India, came back in 99. And it's quite difficult when you come back in an organization like HSBC to, 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 to work out what your next step is, because at that stage I'd spent three and a half years living in India and the previous three years commuting to India. So I was Mr. India, as far as the investment bank was concerned. And uh, being back in London, that wasn't a role I could easily deploy. So I had to reinvent myself. And the CEO of the investment bank at that stage, lovely man called Keith Harris, said to me, look, we're about to go to industry specializations within our investment bank. At that stage, we had telecoms and oil and gas. I think we're the only two industry specializations. He said, I want to have 10 or 12 of these. Um, you know, are there any you're interested in? And I looked at some of them like mining, which I knew very little about, or geology, which I knew very little about, I, pharmaceuticals I knew nothing about. And I had envisaged that if I took on pharmaceuticals, I'd be up against people who'd qualified as doctors, and I thought that might be a bit tricky. So I chose consumer on the basis that we are all consumers, and we all have a view, we all go to hotels, we all eat in restaurants, we all go to cinema chains, we all... Uh, go to sporting occasions, caravan parks, bingo halls, whatever it may be, we all have views on these things and I wouldn't be at a competitive disadvantage against any other sector specialist bankers. So when I came back from India in 99, I reinvented myself as a consumer specialist. But I, find, I found the reintegration into London really tough. Uh, you'd, I'd gone from being a 30-year-old CEO setting up my own business from scratch and by the time I'd finished in India, we had four offices and uh, about 50 employees and about 70% return on capital employed. So it was a very successful business. Age 34, there I was back in London, trying to set up a consumer team from scratch. And at the risk of minor exaggeration, um, I couldn't really do very much without getting numerous approvals from people above me. I couldn't even you know, order a stapler without filling in a form in triplicate. And having had so much freedom in India, I found that very difficult. And I also took the view that as I'd been out to India relatively young and set up a business from scratch, which had been very successful financially, I thought if I could do it in a market like India, which I have no right to succeed in, then why can't I do it in a home market like the UK, which I know well? So I actually plotted my great escape from HSBC, uh, hence the poster behind me. And I called the company McQueen after the lead actor uh, in the film, uh, Steve McQueen. And uh, it was originally a project name uh, in, uh, in 2001. Uh, and then when we actually decided we were going to do this and make it happen and we had to choose a name, we'd been talking about Project McQueen for six months. So we thought, well, let's call it McQueen. So McQueen was born at my kitchen table in London in 2002. And uh, it was it was difficult at first, I'll be honest. I think when we, I underestimated the benefits of, ha of working for two very substantial, well-known brands like Pricewaterhouse and HSBC. And I'll give you a simple example. When you work for an organization like HSBC, you can call up pretty much anybody you like 
And although you won't get through to them first time round because they have a PA or an EA whose job is to prevent you getting through to them, you leave a message and you say it's Sean Brown from HSBC. And because it's a well-known brand, you'll probably get a call back. That may well be that the person you're trying to call thinks that there's been a fraud on their account or there's some issue with a bounced check or something, but they'll call you back because HSBC is a well-known brand and Pricewaterhouse was a well-known brand before. And then suddenly you set up a business from scratch with a made up name like McQueen and I bring people up and say, Sean Brown from McQueen, total silence, nobody knew who that was. Well, what do you want? Why are you calling? So well, I'd like to talk to your boss about M&A ideas. Not interested, thank you very much, go away, we'll call you. And it was very difficult. So it took a long time, at least a couple of years to really get me traction. And there were certainly times in that period when I did question whether I'd made a mistake or not. Uh, I had four relatively young children. I had quite a big mortgage. I moved from um, being a, a senior individual at HSBC and being pretty well paid to uh, uh, being extremely badly paid. Uh, I can remember telling my accountant there was no point in uh, the company paying me anything as the money that was in the company was basically money I'd put in to get it up and running. And there was no point in putting it in and then taking it out again and paying tax on the route. And he said, no, no, Sean, you'll be in breach of the minimum wage regulations. You've got to pay yourself something. So I think I paid myself about £10,000 a year, thinking it would be for about three or four months. Well, it ended up being about two or three years. Uh, so it was a tough time. And my mortgage on my home in London increased each year as I had to have something to live on. Um, but that is, that's what happens with entrepreneurs. You take risks, uh, financial risks. Fortunately for me, this one eventually uh, uh, paid off. And the business grew and we started to get a good reputation. We did some good deals. We won more deals as a result of those good deals, which led us to recruit more people and grow the business. And then in, uh, in 2015, uh, I had a knock on the door from Houlihan Loki, which was a large uh, US investment bank who wanted to buy the business. So um, I was able to pay off my mortgage after I'd sold the business to them. Thank you for that interesting story, especially with uh, how you come up with the uh, name. Uh, so my uh, next question is, uh, you have covered the consumer uh, industry throughout the majority of your career. Uh, now, you also mentioned before, but have there been any other uh, factors uh, that made you interested in this particular sector? And what's your outlook for the future of uh, consumer sector? Yeah, so uh, as I said, I chose consumer because uh, unlike most other sectoral bankers who've worked their way up from having been an analyst, being an associate, being a VP, director, MD, and therefore by the time you get to be the leader of a team, you've done lots of deals in that space. I hadn't done any, or at least that's not true. I'd done a few, but I'd done consumer in just as much as I'd done building materials or shipping or financial services or uh, building material, any other industry. So I'd done a handful of deals in, in consumer. But I liked it. You know, I, I had a view about the brands. Uh, I had a view about shopping. I had a view about hotels, retail, consumer brands, uh, skin care, beauty care, home products. Everybody has a view. You know, you go into a pub, we all have a view, whether it's a good pub with good ambience, you all taste different, uh, different brands of beer. Uh, you have different biscuits. You have different drinks that you like. And, you know, we all have views. So I, I, I had views and uh, I didn't feel that I was at a competitive disadvantage with somebody who'd been working in the consumer space all their career. So that's how I started in consumer. Um, and I think like anything else, the more you devote yourself to a particular subsector, the more knowledgeable you become and the more your reputation grows, the more deals you do, um, the more the reputation grows and it becomes a virtuous circle. And I compare it a little bit with, uh, for example, the medical in industry. So somebody leaves university and wants to become a doctor, they can be a GP uh, and that's fine. They can be a very successful, very happy uh, GP. There are others who will choose a particular branch of medicine to specialize in. And you know, they may become an expert in ear, nose and throat or, or joints or whatever it may be. And if you become an absolute expert in joints or the knee or something like that, then you get to a stage in your career when somebody has a problem with their knee and they ask around all their friends, their contacts, anybody they know in the medical profession, I've got a problem with my knee, 
who is the best knee doctor in the country? And everybody goes, ah, well, if you've got a problem with your knee, then the specialist is, is this fellow over here or this lady over here. And so you, you automatically want to go to the very best. And I think that's what happens when you specialize in investment banking as well. If you're a generalist and you're covering all sectors, that's fine. You can have lots of relationships. But if somebody is making a decision to sell their business, and that is their baby, that is their life, they've built this business up from scratch, uh, they put many, many years of effort into it, it is their financial payday, and they want to sell their business, most of them are pretty fee insensitive. They just want the best advice they can get. Uh, they want to go to somebody who's done it many, many times before and has a track record as long as your arm. You know, I've now sold over 170 uh, food companies in, in, my, uh, in my career, which I think makes me the most experienced food M&A advisor in Europe. Uh, and the good news is that quite a few of those deals have, have yielded some spectacular results. Uh, and therefore, I actually have got to a rather nice place in my own personal career where I often get incoming calls, sometimes from people I don't know, saying I'm thinking of selling my business. And I keep asking around to, uh, to, to take advice from people in the sector as to who I should speak to. And your name, Sean, keeps popping up. So would you mind if we had a chat? So I, I enjoy the consumer sector, partly because I've been doing it so long and I've got a bit of a reputation and a track record, but also partly because it's not a volatile sector. So in the 35 years I've been in financial services, I've seen some industries have great excitement and, and then a great periods of inactivity. So the telecoms industry would be an example. Um, the dot-com boom would be another example. You know, there were even periods in, in my career when I can remember you know, building materials being uh, a very active sector. And yet, uh, and the great beauty of something like consumer is consumer will always be with us. You know, we all have to eat. Um, and, and therefore, there will always be new companies coming up in, in the food space. Uh, there will always be companies who are deciding to churn their portfolio because some of their assets have gone ex-growth. And therefore, there's a regular stream of M&A activity in the consumer space. And frankly, there's no reason to believe that will change. Well, thank you very much for that. I think that was really exciting. Um, I guess the next question I wanted to ask was, it, with your current title as the uh, co-head of corporate finance in the UK for Julian Loki, a lot of our viewers and myself included would like to know, what does a typical day look like with that title? And uh, on top of that, how does Julian Loki perhaps differentiate itself to other firms that you've worked with? Okay, well, two, two great questions. So, I mean, a typical day, I was going to say they're all very different, but actually with lockdown, they'll begin to be a little bit Groundhog Day and they all seem to be the same. So I come down from my bedroom, I have a cup of tea and I come into my home office and then I'm on Zoom calls from about eight in the morning to about eight at night. Um, but of course, every every day is slightly different. Every Zoom call is different. Um, they're not all as, as fun as this where I can rabbit on uh, about myself and bore everybody to tears. Uh, a lot of it is is talking to clients uh, about potential deals, talking to clients about live deals, talking to my colleagues about what they're up to, some of the issues they are, a lot of recruitment, a lot of interviewing, a lot of discussions on strategy and direction, potential acquisitions that Hula and Loki is looking to make, um, and, uh, and a variety of, of other issues that involve running a business. But most particularly, we're in the service sector. And uh, when you're in the service sector, you have to recognize that the client expects you to be on demand for them at any given moment. And as we've said a, a little earlier, when somebody chooses to appoint Hula and Loki to sell their business, it is the most, probably the most significant decision of their financial career. And they believe that that gives them the right to call you any time of the day or night, evenings, mornings, weekends, et cetera. And up to a point, that's true. You know, if they're going to pay us a million pounds or two million pounds to sell their business for them, it's a big fee. And uh, we, need to, we need to be able to give them a, a tremendous service in return for that. Um, and if they feel that they want to have access to me in addition to the team, then they have every right to have access to me. So I spend a lot of my time still working with clients, 
talking about strategy, talking about who the potential buyers are, how we position their business to make it most attractive to the potential buyers, uh, what the strategy is, what the tactics are, reviewing the offers when they come in, deciding how to respond to each bid, um, deciding what further information to give to potential bidders and when, which points of negotiation as we negotiate the sale and purchase agreement are really important to us, which are less important to us. Sometimes you've got to pretend that one is very important when it's not important at all, so that you can have your arm twisted to concede on it, but you never really fussed about it anyway, but in return, you get something that you do really want. So there's a lot of tactics, a lot of strategy. Uh, it's like a giant game of chess. And if you've, you know, if you've ever watched The Queen's Gambit on Netflix, or if any of you actually play chess, you're always trying to think three or four steps ahead. Uh, and, and that is what I spend a lot of my time doing when I'm doing deals. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, I guess the last question from me then would be, uh, you, you mentioned just a while ago that you've advised on over 100 food deals over the course of your career, and I'm guessing there's uh, other sectors as well which you've said you've covered. Does one particular deal that you've advised on stand out as being perhaps the most exciting deal? And Would you be able to tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> I, I'm not sure there is one, Patrick. There's a whole host of them, and I, I, I certainly remember uh, the first deal I did when I started going to India in, in 1992, 1993. Uh, you know, I was still in my 20s and I, I did a, uh, I think it was a $150 million equity issue for a, a Southern Petrochemical Industries Corporation Limited. Um, so that was the first deal I did in India. I also have a great deal of, of affection for the first major deal I did when I set up McQueen, which was selling a business called Dorset Cereals, which some of you may remember, which I... Uh, sold to yeah. uh, John Magnier and JP McManus and, and Wellness Foods. Um, but then otherwise, it's almost, you know, it's a bit like, I sound a bit like a football manager here. It's always your most recent deal. So we did a, um, we did a very good deal not very long ago, uh, actually a year, a year or so ago now, where we sold a, a business that was three years old called Tails.com. Uh, it does personalized pet food for your, your dog. And you, you say what age your dog is, what weight your dog is, how much exercise your dog has, whether there are any particular issues, male, female, nursing, breastfeeding, pregnant, whatever. And on the back of that, you get a personalized pet food for your dog. And now this was a business that was only three or four years old, and, and we sold it for a rather spectacular price, actually, to, to Nestle, uh, making the founders um, a good amount of money and have a little tombstone of that deal as well actually so um, uh, yeah uh, lots and lots of deals I've, I've particularly enjoyed I'm, I'm not sure there's one I'd, I'd pick out. Thank you. Thank you for that and uh, for the last question uh, what advice would you have for younger people looking to go into investment banking and what can they expect from this industry? Well the first point to make is that investment banking is a an enormous area and there are so many subsectors within investment banking that it's really important to try and identify which bit you're interested in. So are you interested in equity research? Are you interested in equity sales? Are you interested in, in debt? Are you interested in project finance? Are you interested in restructuring? Are you interested in investing as, as an asset manager or investing in private companies through the private equity world? Are you interested in M&A? There are so many aspects that fit under this umbrella expression of investment banking. Um, in my particular area of expertise is, is M&A, which in its very simple terms is helping people buy or sell businesses and associated capital raising for them. And, and that's what I can talk about with, with the, the greatest degree of knowledge. And I think the advice I would give to people uh, who are interested in pursuing that career is, is several fold. Firstly, uh, the hours are unrelenting. They are really, really horrendous. And therefore, don't do it unless you really, really enjoy it. Because if you are spending 15 hours a day working, uh, and you're regularly working at weekends, and you're getting used to having your holidays cancelled because there is a client assignment on, um, that can hurt a lot of people. And you, you have to be totally committed and totally determined. And, you, and to do that, you have to really enjoy it. So I, I can't remember who it was that said, I mean, somebody far brighter than me said, you should go and work 
in something you enjoy doing because then it won't feel like work. And, uh, and, and I would echo that for, for the M&A industry. If somebody out there is saying, well, I don't really know about m and I don't know if I'm gonna enjoy it or not, I'll give it a go, then that doesn't bode very well. I think if you've really done a lot of homework and you get excited by identifying buyers, by coming up with a strategy, by helping entrepreneurs uh, monetize their lifelong investments, and if that really turns you on, uh, then the fact that you're working from eight in the morning till midnight, day after day after day, won't worry you because you feel you're learning, you feel you're doing something you really enjoy and, uh, and, and, and you're learning and that's the main thing. But you've got to be totally committed. I think the second point is you have to be so persistent. Um, getting jobs in the industry is, is very tough, uh, partly because it is very well paid. Uh, and you know, if you take even somebody like Hula and Loki in London, we'll have two or 3,000 applications for our website uh, each year for maybe 10 places. And trust me, I, you know, I don't personally look through all 10, 3,000 of those CVs, but I'm told that you know, a good half of them would be from individuals who are perfectly well qualified to come and work for Ula and Loki. And therefore, those that get the final nod to be the 10 successful people out of 2,000 or 1,000 and 1,500 CVs, you've just got to be incredibly lucky. You've got to have the right attitude, focus on building up your CV, um, having experience in the sector. And, and I know it's chicken and egg argument, but it's really important because people like us, the last thing we want is to go through this enormous recruitment exercise, bring on board somebody who after two weeks turns around to me and says, oh, I didn't know what M&A was. It's nowhere near what I thought it was, and therefore I'm off to go and do something else. Or, I mean, I had, I had one two years ago, lovely guy, actually, very impressive individual who came to see me after five weeks. And he said, I can't stand this any longer. He said, I, you know, I keep having to tell my uncle I can't have dinner with him night after night after night. And, you know, I don't fancy that as a lifestyle. It's a pity, but I mean, I told him many, many times before he joined, you know, if he wanted to join, our firm, and it's the same with pretty much, much, any, much any other M&A advisory firm, the hours can be brutal. So you really do need to enjoy what you do and you have to sort of slightly put your social life on, on hold. So I'm not sure that's, that's the advice you want to hear, but that is the most honest advice I can give. Well, those are all the questions that we have today for you, Sean. Uh, thank you for your time, uh, for the brilliant answers and insights. And for our viewers, uh, please do consider of liking this video and subscribing to our channel. It's been a great pleasure to chat to you today. I hope, uh, I hope a few people who've watched it make it through to the end. <laughs>